was 1945. The war was over. Slowly, painfully, life came back to the ruins of Europe. The war was over, but there was no peace. Despair crouched over the continent. Hopelessness circled Europe like a bird of prey. Why? What were the forces that turned nations into rubble heaps and populations into beggars? The people wanted the answers. They wanted to know what happened and why. In the Palace of Justice in Nuremberg, the people of the world came together. For there sat the International Military Tribunal to judge the chief Nazi war criminals. Robert H. Jackson, the chief American prosecutor, makes the opening statement for the prosecution. The privilege of opening the first trial in history. The privilege of opening the first trial in history for crimes against the peace of the world imposes a grave responsibility. The wrongs which we seek to condemn and punish have been so calculated, so malignant, and so devastating that civilization cannot tolerate their being ignored because it cannot survive their being repeated. That four great nations, flushed with victory and stung with injury, stay the hand of vengeance and voluntarily submit their captive enemies to the judgment of the law is one of the most significant tributes that power has ever paid to reason. This inquest represents the practical effort of four of the most mighty of nations, with the support of 15 more, to utilize international law to meet the greatest menace of our times, aggressive war. The common sense of mankind demands that law shall not stop with the punishment of petty crimes by little people. It must also reach men who possess themselves of great power and who make deliberate and concerted use of it to set in motion evils which leave no home in the world untouched. In the prisoner's dock sit 20 odd broken men. Reproached by the humiliation of those they have led, almost as bitterly as by the desolation of those they have attacked, their personal capacity for evil is forever past. Merely as individuals, their fate is of little consequence to the world. What makes this inquest significant is that these prisoners represent sinister influences that will lurk in the world long after their bodies have returned to dust. They are living symbols of the arrogance and cruelty of power, of racial hatreds, of terrorism and violence. They are symbols of fierce nationalisms and of militarism, of intrigue,
and war making, which have embroiled Europe generation after generation, crushing its manhood, destroying its homes, and impoverishing its life. They have so identified themselves with the philosophies they conceived and with the forces they directed that any tenderness to them is a victory and an encouragement to all the evils which are attached to their names. What these men stand for, we will patiently and temperately disclose. We will give you undeniable proof of incredible events. The catalog of crimes will omit nothing. It may be that these men of troubled conscience do not regard a trial as a favor but they do have a fair opportunity to defend themselves, a favor which they rarely extended to their fellow countrymen. We will not ask you to convict these men on the testimony of their foes. There is no count of the indictment that cannot be proved by books and records. And we will show you the defendant's own films. You will see their own conduct and hear their own voices as they reenact for you from the screen some of the events in the course of the conspiracy. The acts of the defendants have bathed the world in blood. and set civilization back a century. They have subjected their European neighbors to every spoliation and deprivation. They have brought the German people to the lowest ebb of wretchedness. They have stirred hatreds and incited domestic violence on every continent. These are the things that stand in the dock shoulder to shoulder with these prisoners. The real complaining party at your bar is civilization. The United States of America present count one of the indictments that all the defendants participated as organizers or accomplices in a common plan or conspiracy to commit crimes against peace, war crimes, and crimes against humanity. The aims of this conspiracy were open and notorious. The aims of this conspiracy were open and notorious. It was far different from any other conspiracy ever unfolded before a court of justice. Pistol shots and then wild firing. The heart leapt as old war experiences were relived. Its history is the history of the Nazi party which grew from the brawling streets of Munich in the 20s. And from the beginning, Adolf Hitler and his followers were committed to the use of any means, whether or not they were legal or honorable. Their aim was the highest degree of control over the German community. Their intentions were blatantly put forth in Mein Kampf and the party program. And they preached their favorite doctrine up and down the land. They said that persons of a so-called German blood were a master race, entitled to subjugate or even exterminate other races. They said that the Germans should be ruled under the Führerprinzip, or leadership principle by which each sub-leader owed unconditional obedience to his superior, and so on, right up to Adolf Hitler. They said that war was a noble and necessary activity of Germans. And they said that the Nazi party alone had the right to rule Germany, and the right to destroy the party's enemies. Right.
rise to power was based on fraud, deceit, intimidation, and coercion. Culminating finally in terror and flame. Into that flame went the democratic constitution of the Weimar Republic and the freedom of the German people. For the fire set by the Nazis extended to the very Reichstag. Hans Gesevius, a witness who formerly held a high position in the Berlin Police Administration, tells of his investigation of the Reichstag fire. Um es kurz zu sagen, zunächst den Tatbestand zu geben, haben wir festgestellt. To speak briefly and to state the facts. First of all, we ascertained that quite generally, Hitler had stated the wish for a large-scale propaganda campaign. Goebbels took on the job of making the necessary proposals, and it was Goebbels who first thought of setting the Reichstag on fire. A group of ten reliable SA men was made ready, and now Goering was informed about every detail of the plan. It was expected from Goering, and he gave his assurances that he would do so that the police would be instructed, while still suffering from shock, to take up a false trail. Using the Reichstag fire as a pretext for seizing power, the Nazi conspirators lost no time in tearing Germany away from a policy of peace. Late in 1933, they led their nation out of the disarmament conference, quit the League of Nations, and embarked on a course of secret rearmament. By 1934, the new armaments program designed by defendants Goering, Schacht, and Funk was going full blast. German industry was again turning out the tools of war. The Krupp plants hummed, and one year later, Goering could announce, from the strong foundation of the National Socialist ideology, today rises once again the German armed forces. A few days later, General von Blomberg announced the new law for compulsory military service. The law was signed by defendants Goering, Hess, Frank, Frick, Schacht, and von Neurath. The training began. Finally, in spring of 1936, the Nazis sent their new troops marching into the Rhineland. Mein Führer, on March 7, 1936, soldiers of the army, which was created by order of the Führer, crossed the sacred river of German history and occupied their former garrisons. They pledged the Führer whatever decisions he may make, unbreakable faith and obedience. And they vow to follow him and to prove their sincerity by their never-ending love for Germany. The columns grew longer. The sound of boots grew louder on the streets of Nuremberg. But Hitler said, the German people is not a people which welcomes a war today, tomorrow, or the day after tomorrow. That is not in the character of the German. He is by nature not only peaceful and peace-loving, but above all, conciliatory. He wants to work. In our country are millions of peasants. They want to kill their fields. They want to bring in their harvest. There are millions of workers. They want to perform their work. But the Nazi conspirators 
in the name of Lebensraum, continued to plot new aggressions against peace. In November 1937, Hitler called a special meeting with defendants Goering, von Neurath, and Raeder, and generals von Blomberg and von Fritsch. The meeting was secret, but Lieutenant Colonel Hossbach, Hitler's personal adjutant, faithfully recorded Hitler's words. The German question can be solved only by way of force. For the improvement of our military political position, it must be our first aim, in every case of entanglement by war, to conquer Czechoslovakia and Austria simultaneously. The annexation of the two states to Germany, militarily and politically, would constitute a considerable relief. This meeting set the stage for Nazi expansion, and Act I came only three months later at Berchtesgaden, where Defendant von Papen finally engineered a meeting between Schuschnigg, the Austrian Chancellor, and Hitler and Defendants Keitel and von Ribbentrop. Guido Schmidt, who was Austrian Foreign Minister at the time, also attended the meeting, and now he takes the witness stand. Did Hitler demand that Seiss Inquart be made Minister of Security? That was one of the demands on their program. Were there also demands made with regard to currency exchange and customs? There were demands of an economic nature of every kind. Hitler told you that you had until February 15th to accept his terms, didn't he? And he told you that if you didn't do so, he would use force? The ultimatum, as Hitler stated it, was that he intended, as early as February, to march into Austria, and that, for the last time, he was prepared to postpone it. Faced by these threats, the Austrians carried out all Hitler's demands. But the Nazi conspirators weren't satisfied. A month later, when Schuschnigg announced a plebiscite on Austrian independence, Hitler and defendant Goering demanded the plebiscite be canceled. Another ultimatum demanded Schuschnigg resign within three hours. Fearing invasion, Schuschnigg resigned, and finally defendant Seiss Inquart was appointed the new chancellor of Austria. That same day, Goering in Berlin called Kepler of the German embassy in Vienna. The conversation was transcribed. Kepler spoke first. Well, we represent the government now. Yes, that's it. You are the government. Listen carefully. The following telegram should be sent here from size in class. Take the notes. The provisional Austrian government sends to the German government the urgent request to support it in its task to help prevent bloodshed. For this purpose, it asks the German government to send German troops as soon as possible. Well, SA and SS are marching through the street. Everything has collapsed for the professional groups. Size so Import is the only one who still has power in Austria. Yes. Then our troops will cross the border today. The act was written, joining Austria to Germany, and signed by defendants Seiss Import, Goering, Frick, von Ribbentrop, and Hess. Hitler, of course, had said, Germany neither intends nor wishes to interfere in the internal affairs of Austria, to annex Austria or to conclude an Anschluss. 21st of May, 1935, Adolf Hitler. The curtain fell on Act One, but already the Nazi conspirators prepared for Act Two with this 1938 memorandum from Hitler to his high command. It is my unalterable decision to smash Czechoslovakia by military action in the near future. It is the job of the political leaders to bring about the politically and militarily suitable moment. Conrad Henlein was designated political leader. The plan was labeled Operation Green, and Defendant Yodel issued another memorandum reading Operation Green will be set in motion by means of an incident in Czechoslovakia which will give Germany provocation for military intervention. The fixing of the exact time for this incident is of the utmost importance. A few months later, Germany signed the Munich Pact 
with England, France, and Italy. This pact involved the transfer of the Sudetenland to Germany. The conspirators called it their last territorial demand. But before the ink was dry, they were making other plans. For Hitler's goal was the complete absorption of Czechoslovakia. And now the Czech president, Hasha, was called to a meeting with Hitler and defendants Goering, von Ribbentrop, and Keitel. They gave him the ultimatum. Bohemia and Moravia would be incorporated into Germany immediately, or Czechoslovakia would be invaded Prague destroyed from the air. Pacha was helpless. Defendants von Ribbentrop and Frick signed the decree making Bohemia and Moravia a German protectorate. Speaking some months before about the Sudetenland, however, Hitler had said, I have promised and repeated here that there will be no more territorial problems for Germany and Europe. I will be no longer interested in the Czech state. And I will guarantee it, 26 September 1938, Adolf Hitler. Now, according to more of his adjutant's notes, Hitler reviewed the Nazi plan of violence and treachery from 1934 to 39. The notes read, First, rearmament. In 1935, the introduction of compulsory military service. After that, militarization of the Rhineland. One year later, Austria came. It brought about a considerable reinforcement of the Reich. The next step was Bohemia and Moravia. Then followed the erection of the protectorate, and with that, the basis for action against Poland was laid. Basically, I did not organize the armed forces in order not to strike. The decision to strike was always in me. In the name of the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Northern Ireland, Sir Hartley Shawcross presents count two, crimes against peace, charging that all the defendants participated in the planning and waging of wars of aggression was in violation of international treaties, agreements, and assurances. The first step was the Rhineland, and the next step was Austria. The Rhineland is occupied, Austria and Czechoslovakia are seized by Germany, and now the Nazi conspirators turn to the next problem, the conquest of Poland. Again, an adjutant, Lieutenant Colonel Schmundt, transcribed Hitler's words. The solution of the problem demands courage. It is impossible without invasion of foreign states or attacks on foreign property. There is, therefore, no question of sparing Poland. And we are left with the decision to attack Poland at the first suitable opportunity. We cannot expect a repetition of the Czech affair. There will be war. Meanwhile, according to their well-established practice, the conspirators stirred up the Danzig issue to furnish frontier incidents which could justify an attack on Poland. Then, on 23 August, the Nazis signed their non-aggression pact with Russia. Then Hitler told his high command, Now Poland is in the position in which I want her. I'm only afraid that at the last moment some Schweinowen will make a proposal for mediation. Appeals were made twice by the Pope and by President Roosevelt. Finally, Mr. Roosevelt asks that assurance be given him that the German armed forces will not attack and, above all, not invade the territory or possessions of the following independent nations. He then names as those coming into question Finland, Lettland, Litauen, Estland, Norway, Sweden, Denmark, Niederlande, Belgium, Großbritannien, Irland, Frankreich, Portugal, Spanien, die Schweiz, Liechtenstein, Luxemburg, Polen. Meine Antwort! On 1 September 1939, the Nazis sent the Wehrmacht smashing into Poland and into a new world war. For France and England, faithful to their mutual assistance pact with Poland, immediately declared war on Germany. The 
Luftwaffe opened mass attacks on Polish towns and cities. And Hitler, according to Schmundt's notes, said, Destruction of Poland in the foreground. I shall give a propagandist course for starting the war. Never mind whether it be plausible or not. Have no pity. Take a brutal attitude. But, as usual, before the attack on Poland, Hitler told the world, During the troubled months of the past year, the friendship between Poland and Germany has been one of the reassuring factors in the political life of Europe. 30th of January, 1939, Adolf Hitler. The path of destruction started in Poland, but soon it led north and south across all Europe. And each new aggression was based on Hitler's principle that in war, victory, not right, is what matters. Non-aggression treaty, it is firmly resolved to maintain peace between Denmark and Germany in all circumstances. 31st of May, 1939, Ribbentrop. But on 9 April, 1940, German troops invaded Denmark. Reich government is determined, in view of the friendly relations which exist between Norway and Germany, under no circumstances to prejudice the inviolability and integrity of the Norwegian state. 2nd of September 1939, Deutsches Reich. But on 9 April 1940, German troops invaded Norway. the governments of Belgium, Holland, and Luxembourg that Germany will not violate their neutrality. 6th of October, 1939, Adolf Hitler. But on May 10th, 1940, German troops invaded Belgium, Holland, and Luxembourg. established, reliable relationship of Germany to Yugoslavia will represent an element of calm to our nerve-wrecked continent. This peace is the goal of all who are disposed to perform really constructive work. 1st of June, 1939, Adolf Hitler. But on 6 April, 1941, German troops invaded Yugoslavia. criminal methods of the Nazi conspirators brought them early success, and by 1941, they had most of Europe under their heel. Now an evil ambition for power and more power drove them on. But two of the world's mightiest nations, the United States and Soviet Russia, remained to block the Nazi drive for world supremacy. 
They had to be dealt with firmly, immediately. And now Germany asked for cooperation from her full partner in aggression to the east and from her junior partner to the south. In Berlin, they drew up the Axis Pact, the blueprint of the new order, and parceled out the continents of the world for Axis domination. Italy was to get the Mediterranean sphere. Japan was to get the Orient. And to Germany would go the rest of the world. In June 1941, in violation of their non aggression pact, the Nazis sent the Wehrmacht deep into Soviet territory, according to military plans long made. As usual, there was no declaration of war. Hitler had said, today Germany, tomorrow the world, and this was tomorrow. Land warfare in the east, air warfare in the west. For now, defendant Goering's Luftwaffe was hurled with full force against the people and cities of Britain. Hitler, after all, had told the Reichstag, I will blot out their cities. December 1941, the Japanese, keeping their end of an infamous bargain, struck at the United States, also without declaration of war. Japanese bombs rained on Pearl Harbor, spreading war finally to the Pacific. The new order was on the march. World War II flamed around the globe. In the name of the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics, General Rudenko presents counts three and four, charging that all the defendants committed war crimes in Germany and in all those countries occupied by Germany. The Nazi conspirators committed crimes against enemy armies, against prisoners of war, against the civilians of occupied lands. They believed in the barbaric doctrine of total war and considered themselves freed from the restraints of international law or the established customs of war. Their ruthless policies were ordered in directives like this one from General Reinecke of the Wehrmacht High Command. The Bolshevist soldier has lost all claim to treatment as an honorable opponent. Active or passive resistance must be broken immediately by force of arms. Prisoners of war attempting to escape are to be fired on without previous challenge. No warning shot must be fired. More proof of this savage Nazi policy comes from the affidavit of Kurt Lindau, former Gestapo officer. There existed in the prison of war camps on the Eastern Front small screening teams headed by lower ranking members of the Gestapo. It was the duty of these teams to segregate the prisoners of war who were candidates for execution according to the orders that had been given and to report them to the office of the Gestapo. And a letter from Defendant Rosenberg to Defendant Keitel in 1942 stated clearly, A large part of the Soviet prisoners of war has starved 
or died because of the hazards of the weather. In many cases, prisoners of war could no longer keep up on the march because of hunger and exhaustion. In numerous camps, no shelter for the prisoners was provided at all. Even tools were not made available to dig holes or caves. Yet, when some objected that this treatment violated the Geneva Convention, Defendant Keitel answered with this memorandum. We are concerned with the destruction of an ideology. Therefore, I approve and back the measures. This is proved by the testimony of General Lahousen, who worked under Admiral Canaris in the op there. General Lahousen attended conferences where crimes against whole populations were plotted in advance by the Nazi conspirators. Will you please explain exactly what took place at this conference in the Führer's train? First of all, Canaris had a short talk with von Ribbentrop, particularly as regards the Polish region. Secondly, Canaris spoke vehemently against the measures that he, Canaris, had found out about, to wit, the projected shooting and extermination measures that were being directed against the Polish intelligentsia, nobility and clergy, as well as all elements that could be regarded as embodiments of the national resistance movement. said at the time, more or less verbatim, that the world will at some time make the armed forces under whose eyes these events have occurred also responsible for these events. Defendant Frank, Nazi governor of Poland, was another of the conspirators guilty of directing mass murder. In his diary, he speaks of taking advantage of the focus of attention on the Western Front by carrying out wholesale liquidation of thousands of Poles. These atrocities were not restricted to the East. Here is the proof in the village of Oradour sur Glane, France. San Callisto Caves, Italy, where 350 hostages were carefully listed. And systematically murdered. And here is Lidice in Czechoslovakia. In blind retaliation for the assassination of SS man Heydrich, the Nazis murdered all Lidice's men and sent their women and children into slavery in Germany. But this was not enough. Boys of the Arbeitsdienst were moved into the ruins of Lidice and ordered to level the village to the ground. be the Nazi's example to all occupied peoples. But 
more terrible still were the concentration camps, which from the beginning had been the conspirators' chief weapon against opposition of every kind. German anti-Nazis were the first victims, but with the war their numbers swelled to include citizens of all the nations of Europe. Their fate is described by witness Rudolf Hess. I commanded Auschwitz until the 1st of December 1943 and estimate that at least two and a half million victims were executed and exterminated there by gassing and burning. At least another half million succumbed to starvation and disease, making a total dead of about three million. Included among the executed and burned were approximately 20,000 Russian prisoners of war who were delivered at Auschwitz and Wehrmacht transports. The remainder of the total number included about 100,000 German Jews and great numbers of citizens from Holland, France, Belgium, Poland, Hungary, Czechoslovakia, Greece and other countries. Medical experiments, too, were standard procedure at many concentration camps. These included lowering the body temperature to 28 degrees centigrade, high altitude tests in pressure chambers, experiments with poisoned bullets and contagious diseases, and even sterilization experiments. This was genocide, the premeditated destruction of entire peoples. Genocide, the direct result of the Nazis' claim that they had the right to destroy the party's opposition. Tomorrow the world, dead or alive. In the name of the French Republic, Monsieur de Monton closes count three and four, the final charges of the indictment. All the defendants committed crimes against humanity, including the murder and persecution of all people opposed to the Nazi party, and the enslavement, exploitation, and deportation of civilian populations. The slave labor policy was the responsibility of defendant Sauko, who admitted in 1944, out of the five million workers who arrived in Germany, not even 200,000 came voluntarily. Forced labor often meant brutal and degrading treatment, for Sauckel himself suggested. All the men must be fed, sheltered, and treated in such a way as to exploit them to the highest possible extent at the lowest possible expenditure. And defendant Bormann added, the Slavs are to work for us. In so far as we do not need them, they may die. Slavery was only one aspect of Nazi exploitation. Defendant Goering, in a talk with German occupation authorities in 1942, discussed another, plunder. God knows you are not sent out to work for the welfare of the people in your charge, but to get the utmost out of them so that the German people can live. This everlasting concern about foreign people must cease now, once and forever. I have here before me reports on what you are expected to deliver. It makes no difference to me in this case if you say that your people will starve. But Nazi crimes against humanity were not limited to foreign peoples. Defendant Frick, as Minister of Interior, directed a program aimed at aged, insane, or incurable Germans, the so-called useless eaters. Thousands were committed to special institutions. Few ever returned. Evidence proves they were murdered because they were useless to the plans of the Nazi conspirators. But perhaps the greatest crime against humanity the Nazis committed against the Jews. A campaign of hate and murder that goes to the heart of the Nazi movement.
German citizens are only those of German or related blood willing to serve the German Reich and people. Marriages between Jews and citizens of German or related blood are prohibited. SS Brigadier General Stroop, in charge of the Warsaw Ghetto in 1943, had learned his Nazi lessons well. In a secret report, he said, The Reichsführer SS ordered on the 23rd of April, 1943, the cleaning out of the ghetto with utter ruthlessness. I therefore decided to destroy and burn down the entire ghetto. Jews frequently left their hideouts, but occasionally remained in the burning buildings and jumped out of the windows only when the heat became unbearable. Life in the sewers was not pleasant after the first week. Tear gas bombs were thrown into the manholes and the Jews were driven out and captured. Countless numbers of Jews were liquidated in sewers and bunkers through blasting. The longer the resistance continued, the tougher became the members of the Waffen SS, police and Wehrmacht, who always discharged their duties in an exemplary manner. Little by little, the Nazis were reaching what they called the final solution, the total extermination of the Jews of Europe. Huss described the process well. We had two SS doctors on duty at Auschwitz to examine the incoming transports of prisoners. The prisoners would be marched past one of the doctors who would make spot decisions as they walked by. Those who were fit for work were sent into the camp. Others were sent immediately to the extermination plant. Children of tender years were invariably exterminated since by reasons of their youth they were unable to work. We endeavored to fool them into thinking they were to go through a delousing process. It took from three to 15 minutes to kill the people in the death chamber, depending upon climatic conditions. We knew when the people were dead because their screaming stopped. We usually waited about one half hour before we opened the doors and removed the bodies. After the bodies were removed, our special commanders took off the rings and extracted the gold from the teeth of the corpses. Much of this loot was then transferred to secret vaults of the Reichsbank at Frankfurt am Main, the Reichsbank of Defendant Funk. Labor Chief Robert Lai knew that six million Jews died in the Nazis' final solution. In his will, he said, In anti-Semitism, we violated a basic commandment of God's creation. It is hard to admit mistakes, but the whole existence of our people is in question. We must have the courage to rid ourselves of anti-Semitism. God has taught me that in my cell in Nuremberg. And Defendant Frank himself said before this court, haben den Kampf gegen das Judentum jahrelang geführt. We have wir fought against Jewry and we have allowed ourselves to make utterances which are terrible. A thousand years will pass and this guilt of Germany will still not be erased. The prosecution rests. The defense begins. They call 61 witnesses and introduce 38,000 affidavits on the defendant's behalf. They submit 136,000 more affidavits on behalf of the SS, 10,000 on behalf of the SA, 7,000 on behalf of the SD, 3,000 on behalf of the general staff and OKW, 2,000 on behalf of the Gestapo. 
These attorneys were personally selected by the defendant. Many are well-known German lawyers, and each now rises to plead acquittal for his client. Some make blanket denials of all guilt. Some of the defendants had, without doubt, a great influence in those spheres which did not interest Hitler. They had no part whatsoever in the great decisions concerning war and peace, armistice and peace offers, etc. Other attorneys lead their clients through a carefully prepared defense. Here, Streicher is examined. I now continue. It has also been stated by the prosecution that Himmler and Kaltenbrunner would have had no one to carry out their orders to kill if you hadn't made that propaganda and if you hadn't conducted the education of the German people in that sense. I don't believe that those who had been given the order by the Führer to carry out the killings or to pass an order to kill, that those people would have been made to do this by my periodical. Hitler's book, Mein Kampf, existed. And the contents of that book were the authority, the cause. Next comes Kaltenbrunner. You are accused of establishing Mauthausen, of inspecting and visiting this camp regularly. The witness Hellriegel testified having seen you in this camp and further testified having seen you at the inspection of gas chambers and while these gas chambers were in operation. The testimony is wrong. Every concentration camp in the Reich, of which I know anything, was established by Himmler through Paul. Later, the prosecution is allowed to cross-examine the defendants. Rosenberg is questioned. Did your ministry force people to leave their homes, to go to Germany, to work for the German state? It is true that force was used, and it is not denied that some terrible encroachments occurred. Now, Rada takes the stand. On the 23rd of May, in the Reich's Chancellery, Hitler said that he would give you an indoctrination on the political situation. And he said, we are left with a decision to attack Poland at the first opportunity. Did you still think that he had no aggressive intentions? I have not feel longer geglaubt. I believed that for a long time. Just as General Jodl said, after Hitler had solved the Czech problem purely politically, it was to be hoped he would also be able to solve the Polish question without bloodshed. I believed that until the last moment, until the 22nd of August. Keitel is cross-examined. Yesterday, your counsel showed you this order, dated 16 September 1941. It said that it is necessary to take immediate cruel measures and that human life in the East is absolutely worthless. You remember the basic idea of the order, that human life costs absolutely nothing? Please answer the question. You signed this order with this statement? Yeah. Next, Yodel. Do you remember any other reason for such great mortality among Soviet prisoners of war. I didn't know the reasons for this mass murder, but they seem to be completely wrong. That I do know. Now, von Ribbentrop. Are you telling the tribunal on your oath that you knew nothing about the effect of military pressure on Austria? I wish to stress again that I knew nothing about military measures and that if I had known something, I wouldn't see any reason not to say so. But it is a fact that during the days before and after the Hitler-Schuschnigg meeting, I was so busy taking over the Foreign Office 
that I could give only slight attention to the Austrian problem. Then Goering is cross-examined. At the end of the meeting, you used the following words, didn't you? German jewelry must, as a penalty, forfeit one billion marks. Then the pigs won't commit any more crimes. Jawohl. Do you still say that neither Hitler nor you knew of the policy to exterminate the Jews? So right as mich betrifft, I already had said that not even approximately did I know to what degree this thing took place. You did not know to what degree, but you knew there was a policy that aimed at the liquidation of the Jews. No, not liquidation of the Jews. I only knew that certain perpetrations had taken place. Spare takes the stand. You were present on April 23rd, 1945, when Hitler received the telegram from Goering suggesting that he take over power. What did Hitler say on that occasion? Hitler war außerordentlich erregt über den Inhalt dieses Telegrammes. Hitler was most excited about the contents of the telegram, and he expressed himself in a very clear manner about Goering. He said that he knew for some time that Goering had failed, that he was corrupt, that he was a drug addict. It was typical of Hitler's attitude toward the entire problem, however, that he followed this statement up by saying, but he can nevertheless negotiate the capitulation. He stated in an offhand manner, it doesn't really matter who does it. His disregard for the German nation was expressed in the way he said this. After months of examination and cross-examination, several defendants make final statements to the tribunal. Frank is first. I myself, speaking from the very depth of my sentiments and from the experience of five months of this trial, want to say this. Now that I have gained the last insight into all that which has been committed in the way of dreadful atrocities, I feel a terrible guilt within me. Funk declares. Als mir nun diese Terror und Gewaltmaßnahmen gegen die Juden When these measures of terror and violence against Jews were put up to me, I suffered a nervous breakdown because at the moment it came to my mind with full clearness that from here on the catastrophe took its course all the way up to the terrible and atrocious things about which we have heard and about which I knew only in part at the time of my imprisonment. I felt ashamed and guilty at that moment, and I feel the same way today, but it's too late. Now Shirak speaks. It is my guilt that I educated German youth for men who committed murders millionfold. Schach is next. Denn er hat alles, was er vorher dem deutschen Volke und damit auch mir versprochen hatte, Everything he promised to the German people and thereby to himself, he did not afterwards keep. He promised equal rights for all citizens, and without regard to their capabilities, his adherents got privileges before all other citizens. He promised to fight against political lies, and together with his minister Goebbels and by himself, he never did anything but disseminate political lies and political fraud. He released criminals and put them into his service. He did everything in a way of not keeping his promises. He deceived the world, Germany, and me. Spare once more. The tremendous danger contained in this totalitarian system only became really clear the moment we were approaching the end. Everything that has happened during this trial, everything you have seen in the way of orders which were carried out without any hesitation, did after all turn out to be mistaken. That is why this trial must contribute to the prevention of such distorted wars in the future and to the establishment of principles for human cooperation.
Herrn Keitel again. I have geirrt. And was not in the way. I erred. I was not able to prevent what should have been prevented. That is my guilt. I can only wish that out of a clear recognition of the causes, of the disastrous methods and the terrible consequences of this war, there will arise for the German people a new hope for a better future and a community of nations. Now, Frank. We call on the German people, whose representatives we were, to abandon this way, which was doomed to failure in the will and justice of God, and which is doomed for everyone who may try to follow it anywhere in the world. The last defendant to speak is Fritzsche. Sie haben von Hitler nichts Gutes erwartet. You of the prosecution did not expect anything good from Hitler, and you are amazed about the extent of what really happened. But then try to understand the indignation of those who did expect something good from Hitler and were betrayed. I am one of these betrayed. Finally, both defense and prosecution sum up their arguments for the tribunal. An aggressor can be branded only by the world's conscience. That supreme organ of humanity must have not only real, but also moral authority. Its impartial judgment must be looked upon with general confidence. It must stand above the contesting parties. In the name of the United States of America, Justice Jackson delivers his summation. According to the testimony of each defendant, these men saw no evil, spoke none, and none was uttered in their presence. If we combine only the stories from the front bench, this is the ridiculous composite picture of Hitler's government that emerges. It was composed of a number two man who never suspected the Jewish extermination program although he signed over a score of anti-Semitic decrees. A number three man who was merely an innocent middleman transmitting Hitler's orders without even reading them, like a postman or delivery boy. A foreign minister who knew little of foreign affairs and nothing of foreign policy. A field marshal who issued orders to the armed forces but had no idea of the results they would have in practice. A security chief who was of the impression that the policing functions of his Gestapo and SD were somewhat on the lines of directing traffic. A party philosopher who had no idea of the violence which his philosophy was inciting in the 20th century. A governor general of Poland who reigned but did not rule. A Gauleiter of Franconia, whose occupation was to pour forth filthy writings about the Jews, but who had no idea that anybody would read them. A minister of the interior, who knew not even what went on in his own office, much less the interior of his own department, and nothing at all about the interior of Germany. A Reichsbank president who was totally ignorant of what went in and out of the vaults of his bank. To say of these men that they are not guilty, it would be as true to say there has been no war, there are no slain, there has been no crime. In the name of the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Northern Ireland, Sir Hartley Shawcross delivers his summation. This trial must form a milestone in the history of civilization, not only marking that right shall in the end triumph over evil, but also that ordinary people of the world, and I make no distinction here between friend and foe, 
are now determined that the individual must transcend the state. The state and law are made for man, that through them he may achieve a fuller life, a higher purpose, and a greater dignity. In the name of the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics, General Rudenko delivers his summation. And when we ask, have the charges against the defendants been proved before the court? Have the defendants been convicted of their guilt? There is only one answer. Their crimes have been proved. Neither the statements of the defendants nor the arguments of the defense were able to refute our grave accusations. It has been impossible to cast doubt on events which actually took place. The truth cannot be challenged. That is the real meaning of this trial. That is the lasting result of our long and strenuous effort. In the name of the French Republic, Monsieur Duryb delivers his summation. When this international trial is closed and the principal war criminals sentenced, we shall go back to our own countries. The fate of these men now lies entirely with your conscience. This is beyond our competence. Our task is finished. Now it is for you, in the silence of your deliberations, to listen to innocent blood crying for justice. Lord Justice Lawrence, Great Britain, Mr. Francis Biddle, United States, Monsieur de Faber, France, and Major General Nikichenko, USSR, and their alternates prepare the verdict. It will be based on the opinion of the majority. The verdict is delivered by Lord Justice Lawrence, President of the Tribunal. Of the organizations, the SS, SD, Gestapo, and Leadership Corps are found guilty. The High Command, SA, and Reich Cabinet, not guilty. As for the individual, Wilhelm Hermann Goering, guilty of conspiracy, crimes against peace, war crimes, and crimes against humanity. Death by hanging. Rudolf Hess, guilty of conspiracy and crimes against peace. Life imprisonment. Joachim von Ribbentrop, guilty of conspiracy, crimes against peace, war crimes, and crimes against humanity. Death by hanging. Wilhelm Keitel, guilty of conspiracy, crimes against peace, war crimes, and crimes against humanity, death by hanging. Ernst Kaltenbrunner, guilty of war crimes and crimes against humanity, death by hanging. Alfred Rosenberg, guilty of conspiracy, Crimes against peace, war crimes, and crimes against humanity. Death by hanging. Hans Frank. Guilty of war crimes and crimes against humanity. Death by hanging. Wilhelm Frick. Guilty of crimes against peace, war crimes, and crimes against humanity. Death by hanging. Julius Streicher, guilty of crimes against humanity. Death by hanging. Walter Funk, guilty of crimes against peace, war crimes, and crimes against humanity. Life imprisonment. 
Hjalmar Schach, not guilty on this indictment, released. Karl Dernitz, guilty of crimes against peace and war crimes, 10 years imprisonment. Erich Rader, guilty of conspiracy, crimes against peace and war crimes, life imprisonment. Baldur von Schirach, guilty of crimes against humanity, 20 years imprisonment. Fritz Sokol, guilty of war crimes and crimes against humanity, death by hanging. Alfred Jodl, guilty of conspiracy, crimes against peace, war crimes and crimes against humanity, death by hanging. Franz von Papen, not guilty on this indictment, released. Albert Speer, guilty of war crimes and crimes against humanity, 20 years imprisonment. Konstantin von Neura, guilty of conspiracy, crimes against peace, war crimes, and crimes against humanity, 15 years imprisonment. Arthur Seiss Inquart, guilty of crimes against peace, war crimes, and crimes against humanity, death by hanging. Hans Fritsche, not guilty on this indictment, released. Martin Bormann, tried in absentia, guilty of war crimes and crimes against humanity, death by hanging. The trial is over. Seven begin their prison sentences. Goering chooses to die by his own hand. The other ten Wait for the gallows. In Nuremberg, the people of the world found out and why. But Nuremberg is more than an answer to a question. As Justice Jackson said, this trial is part of the great effort to make the peace more secure. It constitutes juridical action of a kind to ensure that those who start a war will pay for it personally. Nuremberg stands as a warning to all those who plan and wage aggressive war.